I'm Deirdre Nichols and I'm a portrait sculptor. I specialise in um, por portrait heads mainly. I trained as a sculptor first of all at, at Liverpool School of Art and then at Winchester um, and I had the the good fortune to grow up with a studio background because my father Patrick Burns was a sculptor. He came over from Belfast after the war to Liverpool to look for work after having done an apprenticeship to a sculptor in Northern Ireland and he came to Liverpool to work with the Walgraves Commission. He then met my mother and they both came up to Edinburgh to start their new life which is where I was born. Um, like many women who went to art school in the, the, the 60s, 70s, I had to have a big career break through having children, getting married, and my late husband was in the, the, the services, so moving meant a huge interruption, but I kept the drawing up, and I think the drawing is an excellent foundation for any artist. It's a visual discipline, it's a mental discipline, and it's a physical discipline, and it just keeps that side of your brain alive and awake when perhaps you can't do anything else. I returned to sculpture um, when my children were growing up, when, the, when they were beginning to leave home and, and time was sort of becoming more, more my own. I was still having to work full time to make a living, but I made this conscious decision to get back to sculpture, so I retrained as a, as a teacher. I'd qualified in England, but I went through all sorts of rigmaroles to re-qualify in Scotland. With the, the Mandela project has been the most exciting um, project of my career to date, and this comes about, about seven or eight years since I restarted as a sculptor, so I've done quite a few heads which have some of which are in public places now, so I'm beginning to make a little bit of a reputation for having the ability to get a certain amount of reality and humanity into my portraits. It's the humanity that I really want to try and get across. When I say I'm a portraitist, they automatically think I'm doing something flat, I'm doing a painting. And at art school, we were, I remember being told that the definition of sculpture was what you bumped into when you stepped back to look at the paintings. So, it's quite, so when I say I'm a portraitist, it conjures up a different image. But doing portraits in bronze is a very old-fashioned thing to do, and there aren't many of us doing this. So this call came literally out of the blue, and it's lucky that the email didn't go into the junk box. And it was Glasgow City Council, um, and they had invited six sculptors from Scotland to put forward a proposal to do Nelson Mandela. And this is because, of course, Glasgow was the first city in Europe, if not outside Africa, to recognise this man for who he was and what he was, rather than how he had been misrepresented in the media. I eventually, Glasgow gave Nelson Mandela the freedom of the city in 1981. It wasn't straightforward nor simple. Um, how it came about actually was a Lord Provost in 1979 hosted a lunch for the then apartheid ambassador in this building and we held a picket outside and uh, he eventually was put out of the Labour group um, and uh, after the next election a new Lord Provost, partly to compensate for what had happened, uh, then agreed and the council agreed to give freedom of the city to Mandela. Um, of course they were condemned at the time because Mandela was described in the media as a terrorist and they were then seen as allies and supporters of terrorism. Then of course Nelson Mandela died in December last year. Shortly after that uh, I had a meeting with the Lord Provost and the leader of the, the council to discuss about how we might make a permanent memorial to Mandela but also to give commemorate Glasgow's connection and uh, that's where the idea emerged of uh, a bust in the city chambers. So to celebrate a Mandela Day, Glasgow announced, well wanted to make an announcement that they'd selected somebody to do this portrait but I really 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 wanted to do it, I wanted to do it so much. The first thing I did was get on a train to Glasgow and have a proper look at the city chambers because that was the destination. And although I know the city chambers, I think anyone, anyone who's been there gets a vision in their heads of this magnificent building and all that gorgeous marble.
but it's actually quite a domineering building. It's very, you, you don't clutter up those beautiful spaces unnecessarily. And I wanted to see where it would go, where it could go, because that to me would dictate how it looked. So I, I looked around and I identified a couple of spots and one in particular, I thought that's where it should go. And I then looked at the, the budget and the timing, the timing was so tight. It was a shorter time than I would normally take to do a normal size head. And this is, I decided to make it 10% larger than life and it's a full bust. So I knew that I would have to just drop, be prepared to drop everything, everything, all kind of other work, social life, I was just going to have to focus on this 100%. I think um, uh, she captured the brief best. Um, I think uh, her previous work uh, was much appreciated by the judging panel, the various busts and statues she had made, um, that it was felt that she would capture um, Madiba. Um, we didn't want just a a kind of naturalistic, you know, so it's exactly what you would see, you know, the famous grin. Uh, uh, we wanted to capture the depth, uh, you know, of uh, um, his life and the kind of person he was. But it, it, we wanted uh, uh, an image which would reflect his life of struggle, his courage, his determination, his intelligence, his humour. Not easy. <laughs> and um, to my astonishment and great delight, I, I got an email on Mandela Day saying, congratulations, you have been chosen. And I thought, yes, this, I've, I've won this huge responsibility. When I actually started work, I came into the studio and the first thing I did was I built the armature, um, which is a wooden base and a wooden stand and then some metal work to support the clay and I, I put a t-bar across it to support the shoulders because the clay will not support itself and then started to pack the clay out. I ended up as about 35 kilos of clay in the model that has to be quite a lot of it is self-supporting. While I was doing that I was reading Mandela's writings, I was reading Long Road to Freedom, I was watching the videos about his life, the documentaries and the films that were made about him and I also warned my friends the minute I heard that they would not hear from me for some considerable time. I would not be doing the festival despite the fact that my studio overlooks the courtyard of Summer Hall where a huge amount of the festival takes place. Events were taking place underneath me, music was thumping through the roof and um, everything was going on around me and I was in this little bubble of nothing but Nelson Mandela. For reference material, um, I always start with the skull, I always start with the basics of getting the skull shape right and I'm very familiar with European skulls and European proportions. I've only done one half African skull before so I had to do a bit more work so I've got anatomy books for that. I've also got a small skull which happens to be African and one day in Summerhall I spotted a very beautiful young man walking around with a paintbrush and found out that he'd been co-opted to help with a team that was painting in another part of Summerhall in preparation for some of the festival. So I ran around and asked for permission and asked him if he'd mind um, if I could borrow him to measure his head. He was from Zimbabwe, which is a bit further north, but it's the same east coast and I thought there can't be, the differences would be very subtle, but not, not sufficient to throw me off completely. And I was able to get some proportions and dimensions using his head to help me get started. Um, I then obviously used a lot of photographs, which you can probably see behind me, of Mandela in, at all different ages, in all kinds of moods and from different angles. I particularly also looked at photographs where he was not the subject of the picture, so you're catching an unawares angle where you will see creases in the face that you don't see when perhaps they're full face on to a camera. Um, People often ask, how do I get the likeness? And the answer to that is, I don't try to get a likeness. I believe that if I work from the base up and work really well with the, the anatomy and get the proportions, get the eyes in place, get the, the, the proportion between the, the, the distance between the eyes, the, the eyes to the chin, the, the ears, if I get all these key things in place, 
everything else just comes by itself. There is, um, as I s said before, a wee bit of magic at the end, but it really is the very end when you're putting the, the really final details in, the small wrinkles, little, little bumps and creases. People often say, oh, which photograph did you use, which expression? And the answer is, I, there isn't, I can't say I used one, I used a lot of them and did what I thought would make people instantly know that's Mandela, that's Madiba, that's what he looked like. When I'm doing a, no a portrait, a, a normal portrait, this was very abnormal, this was an extraordinary one to do. When you're doing portraits normally, you, you kind of gauge the time that you've got to, to, to work on the clay and you've got a bit of, I always build in a bit of leeway in case things go wrong, but there is an absolute cut-off point at which time it must go to the foundry. There's, there's no shortcut there, the foundry need blocked out time. The foundry, very kindly, they sent their technicians here first because my studio is two floors up and the first thing they did was they coated it with silicon rubber to stabilise the clay and to protect it and then they let that, let that set overnight so he was covered with all this pink rubber and then the next day two guys from the foundry came back once the rubber had a chance to cure and they carried it very carefully down the two flights of stairs and put it in the van, packed it really carefully with bubble wrap and sandbags and they screwed the base, the base plate that I had it on onto a pallet and then they, they drove it. I mean, a, a piece of precious china couldn't have been treated with more care and respect. And once they got it into the foundry, they coated it with more rubber, let it cure and then they started the casting process. The casting process itself, it's not complex, it's just there are lots of different stages in it and there are curing times and waiting times and it's also highly skilled. The people doing this absolutely have to know what they're doing and I think they're nearly all trained artists there. The people that run it certainly are trained sculptors and the girls in the wax room who make the wax mould for me are absolutely brilliant at what they do. They, they really seem to understand how I work and they can follow the lines that I've, uh, that I've made in it, so when they're joining bits together, they know exactly where to repair stuff and how to repair stuff. So um, it's called the lost wax process, and without going into too much detail, they basically take uh, a plaster cast of this over the rubber, and then they use that to make a wax, which is, ends up like a wax Easter egg, which then has to be packed with um, a grog, and, and then it gets packed around the outside and you end up with wax straws and runners and risers and you end up with this big bulk of a, it looks like a barrel of plaster on the top of which you can just see a wax cup and, and some wax plugs. This is turned upside down and the wax is burnt out and runs out through the, the runners and risers and then it's turned the right way up again, it's buried in a pit of sand. The exciting bit for me is the actual pouring of the bronze where they put the bronze ingots into the furnace and they take it up to really, really high temperature and you've got the noise and the heat and the blast of the, the light and the, the, the guys are all dressed up in their fireproof, heatproof clothing and they seem to do everything on account. And the, uh, moulds are all buried in a sand pit below ground level, so they're, they're they're not having to lift anything. They're taking the cr they're lifting the crucible up on rings out of the furnace, taking it to the bronze, and then tipping it. And this molten, beautiful molten liquid pours in. It's, and I love the smells and the noise and the whole excitement of it. You come back to see it after a, a day after it's cooled, and it looks like nothing on earth. It looks burnt black, horrible, there's all pipes and things sticking out all over it and you think, oh, and, and Kerry at the, that, um, that the foundry is saying, oh yes, it's a great cast, it's a great cast, and I'm nodding and saying, yes, I'm sure it is, but <laughs> they know what they're looking at and more than I do. Um, and then they, they do all the cleaning up work, they take off all the extra pipe work and they weld in anything that's, that needs, you know, if there's any little holes that have blown. And the next time I see it, it's like, um, it's like a new penny, but subtler. It's in a beautiful, soft gold colour. It's actually really tempting to leave it like that, but in reality it needs to be patinated. It needs some kind of surface um, treatment to, to deepen it um, so that it goes an even colour. So we patinate it with um, 
um, acids and things to, to make it darker and then rub it back to, to finish it. In between the work at the foundry and the, the filming that's been going on, I've been uh, going, on, going to see the carpenter out in Dalkeith who's been making the plinth for me and he's an architectural carpenter so he specialises in well it's actually beautiful work, lots of restoration work as well as new work and it's exquisite and he's got a real eye for for proportion, for colour for you know, and for what something actually needs so he was a great person to work with. Well the plinth we've made for uh, Deirdre to uh, present uh, the Nelson Mandela bust uh, has uh, drawn from a, a lot of previous work we've done with other organisations for uh, presenting busts well and in a contemporary manner. What we like to do is use inert materials that won't uh, crack or degrade uh, and will hold, hold a finish well. Um, so this particular product is made from uh, moisture resistant MDF. Um, inside uh, the, the, the plinth we generally ballast uh, the, 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 the structure so to make it more secure on site. I think the other point is the, the, the scale and the height of it is critical and so rather like all the other processes we've done with other artists and designers we did a mock-up and, and a prototype for Deirdre to make sure that the bust was, was at, the, at the sort of a pleasing uh, commanding height to best display it. Well I think we're all very proud to be involved in, in making a, 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 a plinth for the fantastic Nelson Mandela bust that Deirdre has produced. And, and a definitely a sense of pride. So we worked out the, you know, the height and the, the width and the size of it. And I wanted him to be slightly higher than life size because he's 10% larger than life. I wanted everybody to have to look up to him slightly. Everybody, even somebody who was six foot two, I wanted them to have to tilt their heads slightly, just in respect to, to Madiba. So getting that right was important. Because it's quite a soft, gentle portrait. I wanted a gentle lead into him and I did say to the, the carpenter, you do realise if you do a brilliant job on this, nobody's going to notice it because that's, if you notice the plinth, it's like really noticing the frame on a painting. If it jumps out at you, it's not right. Um, and we chose a nice soft green colour which I thought would be good with the bronze and slightly warmer than just, just a neutral colour and also for the the area in which it sits in Glasgow, it, it just wanted to stand out a little bit from, from the background. The day of the ceremony, it was a bit, it was a bit unreal and I thought, well I'll just treat it like I treated everything else, just get up and do the job. So got the train to Glasgow and came out of the station, walked across George Square towards the, the city chambers and there are two vans outside with satellites on and I thought, oh, something must be happening here. And then I suddenly thought, ah yes, it's the Mandela unveiling and I'm slightly involved. I had a coat and a briefcase with, or a little handbag with me and I don't know if you saw that film, The Devil Wears Prada, there's a bit where the girl goes in for an interview with the editor of, of um, Vogue and she's carrying this cheap briefcase and the snooty English girl behind the desk reaches out and grabs it and said you can't go in there with that. Well the same thing happened in Glasgow, this wonderful PA lady. I just got in the door and she barely said hello and she removed, she grabbed my coat and bag and said you're going to be interviewed. <laughs> so I was like oh right okay and there were lots of people already there sort of milling around and it was, it was rather lovely, so I tried to just mill around in the back, hoping that I wouldn't be called forward. I'd been a bit nervous about that, but it was lovely. One of the first people I met was Brian Filling, the Honorary Consul for South Africa, and I do believe it was he who was responsible for Glasgow being aware so early in the day of how special Mandela was. And it was a great delight for me to meet him, and he'd been one of the people who'd chosen me to do the work so that was a particularly nice thing to be able to thank him in person for um, for, for the for the the trust that he placed in me 
Um, and I also met His Excellency, the, the High Commissioner for South Africa, who travelled up from London. And he kept wringing my hands and saying, thank you, thank you for honouring my friend, which was, which was really nice of him. I don't know what I'd expected. I hadn't thought about what I'd expected, but there was this wonderful combined noise from the crowd, which I wasn't, which was really it was a bit of a surprise. They all, there was a kind of, oh, ah, ooh. <laughs> It was, it was just a really instinctive, positive response. I thought it was, it was a response of recognition. And I thought, yes, they, they, they know it's Mandela, it's okay. They know, they know it's not just a random statue or some kind of interpretation of Mandela. They, they, they know this is, this is him and they're, they're, they like it. So it was, a very, it was a very nice moment for me what um, Deirdre said in her submission was captured us um, in her story in relation to how she perceived him and what she would do for it and that's what actually captured um, and why um, Deirdre was chosen as the sculptor to, to do the bust um, and I think we've made an absolute fantastic choice because having seen it today for the very first time um, it is absolutely stunning it is a fantastic um, sculpture captures both, I think, his sense of humour, his humility, and also his statesman-like statue as well. And I think she's captured all of them fantastically well in the sculpture. Being given this commission has been the most important thing of my, my professional career so, so far. And I, I very much doubt I'll surpass this. It, it meant a huge amount to me, the, the trust that was placed in me by Glasgow City Council and by the team who selected me to do this, th that was a great honour to have that trust and I, I was very, I was conscious of it all the way through because in the darker stages where it was getting difficult, the, the fact that they trusted me gave me the confidence as well to keep going. Um, I have thoroughly enjoyed getting to know more about Mandela. I mean, we all kind of know who he is and are aware of him, but I had to look so much more in depth and gazing at his face in pictures and in film day after day after day, hour after hour, minute after minute, scrutinizing every aspect of him and thinking about what he did, what he achieved, how he did it, the grace, the elegance, the humor, the humanity, the compassion of the man. Um, and I felt it was such a, an honour to be asked to do it. I wanted to get all of that over. I wanted the gentleness and I wanted the compassion and I wanted it to look warm. Um, so it was the biggest challenge I've ever, ever had. I've loved every minute of it.